Hmm. Aha. Uh -huh. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to a very special interview series for Improvides. I'm joined by Ben Hunt Davis and Sarah Winkless, two Olympic athletes, and they're here to share their views on what makes high performance teams possible. So, welcome Ben, welcome Sarah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so, why don't you start by telling us about uh, the program that you guys do related to high performance? Um, so, we uh, have a company called Will It Make the Boat Go Faster? It's one of the shorter uh, company titles I can think of. Yeah. Um, and and, and it's, 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 the aim is to help people focus on what really makes a difference. It seems though, I think very often um, people get stuck doing what's in front of them, doing what they've done before, rather than doing the things that really make a difference. And there might be a number of reasons for that. Um, but what we do is we look at kind of three key principles, really helping people focus on what's important, being clear on what they're trying to do, because a lot of people aren't. Um, uh, making sure they're focused on performance rather than just chasing results and working with others so they, they can so they can perform really well and that's, that's what we do. I think that obviously stems from our Olympic experience. I mean, ben was um, a rower as was I and I came from um, a situation where as a women's team we, I joined the national squad and that's a real honour you get to go to world championships but I was amongst a group that had never won an Olympic gold medal. In fact we'd never won an Olympic medal and as a group, we, we went on this journey that went from the first ever Olympic medal being won, every person who went to the Games um, getting a medal. And you notice I'm not saying gold yet, because actually our goal was to get gold medal and to be the best in the world. And the step that we made, or they made, because I actually retired in London, was to stand on the shoulder of those before them and get the golds in London, which we saw so successfully. So it was amazing to be part of that team that First and foremost, we were not a high-performing team. We were individuals who worked really, really hard, were massively ambitious, and were looking to be the best we could be. But the results started to come when we worked together, and you became better than the four people on the lake or the four people in the boat, but the whole team around you were performing at that be their best. And that's the real key thing. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to work with you guys during the London Olympics, and a lot of people see the success that London had, especially in rowing, as far as the number of medals, and especially gold medals. But, I mean, uh, has it always been so easy for Britain to just go out and get medals at the Olympics? <laughs> I, I'm it's not, easy. Actually, yeah, in London it was all really easy for everybody. Uh, I, th I think that, um, well, um, I, I, I was lucky enough to compete at three games. Um, Barcelona, Atlanta and Sydney, and in Atlanta Britain got one gold medal in total. Uh, and if you look where we've gone from the, that one gold medal, Redgrave and Pinson, through to 29 gold medals in London, the performance has been mm. remarkable. And, and there have been a few key things that have driven that. Um, lottery funding uh, started in 97, which made a massive difference, mm. enabling people to be more professional, enabling the support staff to be more professional. And I think that people have, I think the teams have, had the ability to be far more innovative in what they do. Well, one of the key things when I was rowing, we, as Sarah, you know, you said you weren't part of a high performance team. I wasn't either. Um, in nine years of the national team, I only won three proper races. Luckily, they were the last three I did. Three races, not medals. Three proper races, which were the last three I did. Oh wow! Um, and and what we did for the last two years to change our performance was we well we challenged everything, absolutely everything we did as to whether we'd make the boat faster. Uh, and I think that, I think a lot of sports, uh, sports kind of men and women, but also the um, uh, kind of teams have become far, far better at challenging the status quo, um, looking for different opportunities, different angles, different ways of approaching that will that, that lead to high performance. So in these times before you've won your medals and your races, uh, you, you said you've done that for years and did you get a bit frustrated that the success just wasn't coming with the way you were doing things previously? I think it's that if you get what you always do, you'll get what you always got. And it was for me particularly so frustrating because each year I would see my own scores, certain things I was doing and KPIs I was measuring myself and getting better. And yet the results weren't quite there. And it was heartbreaking, I think is a, is a better way than frustration. You know, you get to compete in a rowing, in rowing three times a year. Um, uh, to practice and then your World Championships or your Olympic game. That is it. You're training probably 330 days a year to race on three, four occasions. So those performances have to be right. 
and you see your individual numbers getting better, you go and race the rest of the world, and you're not quite there. And it's a long, lonely two or three weeks that you're meant to be on holiday resting, recuperating when you're sitting there and you're gutted, gutted beating yourself up. And physically, we were training at an absolute limit. Our bodies could not recover if we we're going to do more hours. So you had to do things differently. You had to start thinking about how am I using the people around me? How am I thinking? So I, I've got my body right. It's able to do the rowing stroke. That, that, that's relatively simple. It takes a long time, but it's relatively simple. But how do I add everything else? And what else can I do that isn't going to physically cost me because I need to recover? So it really is about thinking differently, using people differently, and pushing yourself differently. And um, what I found in the men's team was, um, for years I did exactly the same training as Ray Grave and Pinson, and they won everything, and I lost everything. So what they were doing clearly worked, but they're different from me. They were far, far better than me, and what I had to learn to do, and it took, it took me a long time, was, was do what was right for me, what was going to work for me. And we ended up working, we ended up training very, very differently to them, thinking very, very differently to them, because we needed to. Uh, and just because something works for one group of people, doesn't mean it's going to work for anything else, or anybody else. And, um, and trying to get over the kind of heartbreak each year and come back and, and have the ability, have the energy to, to look at things very, very differently was, was hard. I, I remember when you were telling us about your story of when you finally got to the medal stage. That year, you guys weren't really favourites to to achieve what you did because the, the other rowing teams out there were seen as stronger than you, weren't well, they? Well, for, for us, um, so physically they were stronger than us. They were more experienced than us. Uh, and interestingly enough, people in Britain didn't rate us at all. The fact that we won the two events leading up to the Olympics, the fact that we were world silver medalists the year before, it was really interesting. We, we knew we were fast. Everybody else in the world knew we were fast, apart from the Brits, who looked at us as kind of the way we had been, if not being very good. Uh, and very often, you know, we hang on to the perception we have of certain people rather than actually looking at how they've developed and changed. I do think that is a really key point about how we see what we think we're going to see and hold on to perception. So when people are, are walking in and doing a certain, things a certain way, you know, people see that. And actually, one of the things we used to do to trick the brain to see it differently was watch the road straight backwards because you never do that. And you could suddenly see how you were rowing in a different way and the pro progress you'd made. Otherwise, you just saw what you'd expect to see when you were in the boat. And I used to be working and working on something, and you'd notice your coach, and they'd come up, and you knew their first words to you would be your normal fault. And that was so frustrating, because actually I'd work really hard. And I'd be like rowing like Mickey Mouse, not the Mickey Mouse can row, to just you know, make sure that that particular part of my stroke was right. And mass to me, I felt like I was exaggerating it hugely. And there's no difference. And there was no difference. Yeah. Or they couldn't see yeah. a difference. Yeah. And that's the amazing thing. I think when we're used to doing something a certain way, and we've practiced it over years and years and years, it takes a huge amount of effort to do it differently. And I think when you're doing sport, that physicality is a really good um, feedback that actually happens in all parts of your life. So we ended up having these goggles that you could put on while you were rowing. And you could watch a video, a real-time video of yourself as you rode. And for me, it was amazing because the coach would give me an instruction, and I would do the change. And then the video hadn't changed, so I'm thinking this thing's got a lag on it. And then I realised it didn't have a lag on it. The change I was making was not big enough to make a discernible difference into my action. And so one of the things that taught me was how much I had to feel different, how far out of my comfort zone. It had to feel stupid sometimes to really make that change. Which is why I think change in organisations is quite hard. Oh yeah, a lot, a lot of organisations especially have this resistance to doing things in a way that they makes them feel uncomfortable. And uh, that, yeah. that can really lead to people not doing things effectively or yeah. as effic efficiently as they could be. Either because it's hard and it's, it's kind of uncomfortable and we don't necessarily like it, unless we know what we're doing and what we're going to get out of it. Why, why should we do the hard stuff? Or we're scared of it going wrong. You know, what happens if I, if I change this thing and it doesn't work out? What happens to me then? And, and so there are lots of barriers to, to making the changes. And, and the ch I think very often changes aren't quite hard to make. There's no point in going, oh, yeah, it's all, it's all easy to change this. 
very often that's just not the case. We try and make, I think very often organizations try and make change very easy, but actually uh, there are clearly some things that are easier than others, but it's, it takes time. How do you deal with people who have essentially a responsibility for performance and their necks on the line, and if they have a sort of a resistance to changing the way that they've been doing work, uh, how, how do you deal with those people? Okay, well, for, first I'll ask, have they got a responsibility for performance or a responsibility for results? Okay. Because I think the two are quite different. I think, you know, we get measured on results the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, and very often businesses talk about performance, meaning kind of the numbers. And I, I, I think about it quite differently. I think, you know, the results in sport, the results are pretty clear. You win or you lose, you know, you'll, you see your number, your score or whatever. Um, but but what goes behind it is how, how you're performing. When you come away from a competition, an event, a training session, be able to go, how did I perform? How did I do with all the little bits that make up all the, the result? All the elements I put all together yeah. to create that result. And I think how did I perform in those elements? rather than just looking at the end bit of the result. And so I think very often when businesses talk about performance, they actually talk about results. Yeah. Uh, and, if, uh, and if you're looking at the performance, change is easier to make because it's smaller incremental parts that you can work on and, uh, and the risk is less because from, if, if from each meeting you have, from each you know, whatever it is, you come away going, how did I perform? What were the bits that worked really well? What didn't work so well? And kind of what's the difference between the two? What did I learn? You've then got good information that you can go away and do something with rather than waiting until you get a result and then going, what do we do now? I think there's another element to that as well because from, from your setup of the question, you can think about someone's got to where they are through doing a certain behaviour, if they're doing things a certain way. And that can be very comforting. It's given them success, they've been promoted up through it. However, it can also be limiting. And once you start to understand the limitations that um, they're putting in their way by only looking at doing things one way, I find people become more ready to open up and look at their performance in the way that Ben's describing. So it's really breaking it down and understanding where some of these behaviors are coming from, not psychoanalyzing them, but actually, is this the right way to do it now? In this current, we're at 2014 now, you know, the world is different from it is last year, it's different from, certainly it has been for the last five years. So we're actually in a really exciting time. However, there's been a paradigm shift, and I truly believe that within businesses and how people are operating. And there's an opportunity to do things differently, better, you know, and get better results from it. But it's about what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, how they are performing. Okay, so we, we've talked about uh, measuring performance. We're talking about uh, getting more performance out of teams. What about at a sort of management level? If you are responsible for other people, what sort of things can you do to help other people's performance? I, I would say one of the first things is to make sure people are really clear on what they're trying to do. Uh, the, 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 number of, the number of conferences I go to where you know, a senior person stands up and talks about the vision and then sits down, at the end of the day, you spend a bit of time talking about it, and towards the end of the day, you go to anyone in the room and go, so what's, you know, what do you think of the vision? They go, well, uh, uh, and actually being able to articulate what they're trying to do, you know, most people know their job role, but actually knowing what they're trying to do in terms of the bigger picture, I think few people know. Uh, and it's really hard to perform, to challenge your performance, to challenge what you're doing if you, if you haven't got absolute clarity on the direction. So I think one thing that senior leaders, well, leaders need to do, wherever they are in an organisation, is to make sure that their team, their part of the organization has absolute clarity on what they're trying to do. And I think very often in businesses, you know, business is complex. It's not sports simple and straightforward. The, the, the goal is clear and simple. On a certain day, you have to do a certain thing. Business is far more complex. And people use that as an excuse for not having clarity, which I think is a mistake. I think you know once you've got clarity and, and you're leading a team, it's absolutely understand everyone in that team is different. They come with their different strengths and weaknesses. They come with their different skills and motivation. And I, for me, and I and I love this part of it. It's about how do you empower each and every one of those people to be the best they can be, and bring their performance to to, to that team goal. So they're very clear on what they're trying to do, and they also 
understand who they are as a person. So what are their motivations for being there? Why do they want to be part of your team, part of your success? And I think the last thing is, um, as a leader, or the, and you do not have to have all the answers. You have to have the capability of facilitating. That's a good word. You have to have the capability of facilitating the answers for, for with your team. And then people really do get excited because they've been part of the solution. Yeah. I think both of those points touch on something that's very important for leaders to think about because if you're leading a company and you have a vision for where the company is going to be, if what your vision is is different from what the company is currently capable of, then there's this gap. And this gap needs to be filled with a strategy of how you get your capabilities from their current levels to their future levels. Yep. And if that requires your staff to be doing different things or yep. you enabling your staff to find these answers that you don't know the answers for, yep. uh, that requires a bit of bravery in some cases. Yep. I mean, we talk about the crazy goal and your crazy goal might be where that where you can see as a, as the leader your company will be able to get to. It feels crazy to people because it's a stretch, it's challenging, it's different from where you are today. And then we work to understand where people are now and really put some concrete steps um, to help you get there. When I started rowing, I couldn't understand any of the language. I was already an international athlete, I was an international discus, so I was pretty good at sports. So I tried this new sport and frankly, it, I was rubbish. I couldn't understand what the cops were saying to me, I couldn't understand how this whole thing worked. Working in a team with eight people, doing the same thing. I mean, I'd been used to being a star in a team. It, it was so alien. It felt clunky and difficult, and I very nearly stepped away and never did it again. When you're in that space, looking at an Olympic medal, and you've watched the Olympic Games on television, just feels a world away. And it's only by achieving different steps along the way that I got closer and closer. I didn't spend a lot of time looking at the Olympic Games. I mean, I, I tried to do each step I did as well as possible and, and actually promise a little and deliver more if you like. And then I got into the next step and suddenly I'm at my first Olympic Games actually only six years after I took my first stroke, which, you know, was, was pretty, pretty good at the time, I guess. And I, I went on to do three more Olympic Games and my goal was to get an Olympic gold medal. I, I ended up with a bronze. It was really hard to step away from that crazy goal and start working in a new space. But for me, it's a, a massive privilege to be able to support others who are on that journey, whether it's in business, whether it's in sport or, or what it's about. And you know, I think there's so much that business people and people at the top of their games do learn through having to make those steps, keep making those changes that we can share. And I think one of the key things about making the steps is there's got to be a good reason why to make the steps as the steps and engagement is, is absolutely critical rather than a you know, someone saying this is the goal, this is what we're going to try and do. I'm sorry you kept going into this is what I want to do, this is what we... Uh, and, and one way of... Well, in order to help people bridge the gap they've got to be engaged in what they're doing, they've got to know what's in it for them. Um, and that they've got to be involved in the process rather than having stuff done to them and told to them, I guess. I think part of that is learning about what the, who they are, what their motivation is. So if somebody's primary motivation is fun, we don't often use fun in a business context. Well, actually, that might be. And if fun to them is being part of a team, if you then take that individual and leave them alone to, to do some research job, they're not going to be working at their best. They may have to do that some of the time. We can't all be having fun. But it's absolutely recognising that if I'm asking this person to do it as a leader, I'm going to have to have a conversation with them because they will find this hard. And then in the future, we'll find that team, that fun, that element for them that will make a different step. But it's recognising when you're asking your teams to do something that's difficult. So a coach would always look us in the eye and go, you are not going to like this session. This is going to be really tough, but actually it's going to help us get to where we will talk about. And you know, how often does that actually happen in business? Too rarely. Too rarely. Too rarely. So, summing up then, uh, will it make the boat go faster? How can this ethos help businesses and what sort of ways that can they get in contact with you? Um, I think that uh, th th it's a really simple, straightforward question. I'm amazed by how many businesses kind of pick it up and, and latch onto it. Because it's, it, it's this, the concept is really, really straightforward about you know, what you're doing. Is it is it driving you in the direction you want to go? And 
and what we do in various different formats through coaching, through facilitation, through speeches, we um, we help people work out what it means for them essentially. It's a great, you know, for for us it was a great question. Uh, for somebody working in a you know financial services organisation, it may not be the perfect question. And helping them work out what the perfect question is and get them aligned to it and bought into it and engaged to it is is what we spend our time doing. Um, Perfect. Right, Ben, thank you very much. Sarah, pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks to you guys again. Good to see you. Speak soon. Yeah.